Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Thomas. Uh, I fill in a quick talk because there was only one, as I just found out. <laughs> I hadn't looked up the schedule before I came. And um, like, it's going to be a talk about quick things that I learned over the last half year um, setting up with a new company uh, a front end component suite uh, to make a rather ambitious project work. Um, but before that, Oh, I should make sure that my screens work the way I want them. I want to give you an update on something else. You might have heard about that. Well, I'll do this here. Let's play. There we go. That's how I like it. Um, there's a conference here in Singapore that happens about every 18 months by now, or officially whenever I feel like it. Um, it's called JSConf Asia, and it's going to be happening again next year, in June to be exact, so mid next year. Um, we have a really quite exciting venue for it. Uh, we swapped again away from the Capitol Theater, and there's going to be announcements coming all through November uh, on what, how, why, who, all this stuff. Uh, for now, the most important thing is that this event is a community event and it lives off contributions. Uh, so I want to encourage you and whoever you can think of in your company or friends or people you admire online or work with and tell them this is the event you want to contribute to. Um, fill out this form. They don't even need to know about it. We'll reach out to them for you if you don't want to talk to them. Um, but if you think they do awesome things that inspired you or really gave you new knowledge, um, please send them here to submit talks, workshops. This is the first year we're going to have a digital art submission as well. If people just want to do generative art, uh, create visuals or even IoT pieces that somehow react or are interactive or even fully passive and just do their own thing. We're going to have space to exhibit, to showcase, to uh, present whatever creative things that come to your mind. And it's uh, the way that we want to introduce this here that people can work their way into the conference. Because I hear a lot of feedback every year that the conference is so expensive and now you can work your way in. Um, you can give workshops, you can give talks, and you can contribute uh, creative experiences for people to explore during the event. And um, yeah, please, please do that. Tell us what you like, why this is exciting, how we can reach you. And uh, if you have some references or already a working demo on CodePen or something, um, let us know here. It's contribute.jsconfasia. Yeah, and here you can see when exactly it'll be. So you can count that back down. <laughs> um, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about components, uh, specifically the presentational ones. Um, quick questions so that your hands don't get too cold. Um, who of you uses a component library on the front end? Vue, the new Angular, or React, web components? Everybody, great. So most of you are front-end developers. Um, I'm sure you know the differentiation between presentational components and kind of functional components or container components. I mean, there are different names for it. Those that connect to, I assume most of you might use something like Redux or MobX, or those are the functional container ones. And then you have those that are not connected to the app state in whatever reason. Uh, and they're called presentational. Now, uh, I want to introduce a distinction further. Uh, there are two kinds of presentational components, and I'm sure you are doing this already just because it feels natural. There are those that I would like to call base components. They're kind of like single, simple tags that could exist in HTML themselves, like buttons or input fields. And then you have uh, what I want to call um, maybe like model 
components or object components that represent a larger aggregation and represent some piece of content or information, like a, a model, and like uh, in this case, for example, a post. Right? This is like a composite component, you could call it as well. Right? Um, it's not just one thing, although now it is one tag. Right? It's a composition out of many things, and it represents a model object or a piece of content in your application, right? which is different to the button, which is a generic thing that you can reuse all across your, your website uh, in different components. Now, so that was one thing that helped us uh, disting like make distinctions between components and how they should be used. Um, and one thing that I learned, let's start with the simple things, buttons. What's a good button? Well, I mean, you use a button component, right? Everybody uses the correct HTML tags for what they are used, right? Links are A's, lists are ULs, and so on. Why should you do this? Well, it's accessibility, right? So that like, if people might not visually navigate your website, the browser comes with a fantastic set of features to help them navigate. And if you just use the right components, it's way easier for them. Right? They can actually highlight links. They can use their keyboard to navigate your website. If you make diffs with on clicks everywhere, they won't be able to do that. So don't. Right? You're making yourself more work doing this, not less. Um, simple things like use titles whenever you make a button right? and have ARIA labels on them that are speaking text, like this button will do this. And you can write this in text. There are people that listen to websites. So that will help. If you create a good component, you can mark them as required so that every developer suddenly has to enter them. right? Meaning otherwise they get a warning in their console, which is annoying. So And then they just write, OK, whatever. When I click this, you go to this page. Blah, done. Better than nothing. right? So that's why one thing in components that's a pretty good thing. Another thing, um, so we have like different variations of this post. You can see it's like a. If you if you create these kind of model components, they can by themselves be kind of responsive to a degree, right? So they just fit it into whatever space you give them, typically by width. So I would say every kind of composite component or model component should always take 100% of width that it gets, and the height could be either depending on content or also 100%. If you follow that simple rule, what you do to the person that consumes your component is you give them uh, a tool to adjust the size of your component. Because they can define the containing element, the parent element, uh, and give it a certain size that they want, and your component will just fit in. Right? If you do this consistently through all your components, um, you have a way easier way to work with. And it will do one thing that I think is incredibly important. Um, outside CSS doesn't need to change your component. I see this happening way too often, looking to way too many code bases where people in parent components overwrite CSS inside child components. Right? I want the pop-up, like we have a little share pop-up here, but I don't want it with a header. Right? So I use the pop-up, and then I overwrite the CSS to make the header display none. You don't do that. Right? It's a bad habit. Because if anybody ever changes the post, as I did the other day, because on mobile, I kind of wanted to have it full screen and animate it to come from the bottom like that, so that it looks more like a proper mobile app, um, I had to restyle things. And I don't want to go fishing around our entire code base on where anybody has overwritten style for this component so that I can adjust it. Right? So never change style of components that you use in the parent component. You're just making everybody's life more difficult. Um, the same way, you should try to avoid overflow hidden and transitions with a trans or not transition transforms with a translate zero. Right? Whenever you move something on the screen, like you do an animation, like and you use a translate or a scale, or any of, of these transforms, what you're actually doing is you tell the browser, OK, uh, take this out and modify it. 
And what it does, it will make this component overflow hidden for the time period of the transform. And if you don't remove the transform property from the CSS or set it to unset, it will remain in an overflow hidden state. So uh, we had that with something that I can show you here. This is the whole, uh, yeah, this is a fun image. Um, this is a little swipeable component here that you can tap through to get to different session or different taps, if you will. Um, and we had this in like a kind of a mask, if you will, right? A cutout where you have like a container, you make it overflow hidden, and then you have a big sheet of, of paper, if you will, behind it that you just move by position to make this effect, right? Like that's kind of how everybody approached these things. Um, and it turns out that that wasn't great because there's one cool trick in presentational components uh, that is really powerful and helps you to have way less, um, let's call it state traveling, where your component needs to throw an event in a parent component that throws an event in a parent component to trigger this pop-up to show up to capture the entire page, right? We all hate that part because it goes all the way up your code and back down. And you don't need to do that because if you don't have overflow hidden or these transforms still active, you can actually just do position fixed on the whole screen. You can break it out. But the moment you have an overflow hidden or one of these transforms on your component, you cannot do that. It will only take over the content of that hidden overflow container, right? So sometimes you obviously can't do it where you need an, a scroll container or something. But in most cases, you can actually avoid it. Specifically for carousels, avoid it. This is a carousel that doesn't do overflow hidden. If you're interested how that works, come visit me later. I can show you. It's, uh, essentially, they are all like have a hundred percent negative margin on the right, so that they are all these like tabs are just zero pixels width. So they are all begin on the top left position. So that like all I do is I animate them during the animation, like multiple exist. And when the animation is over, the ones that don't need to be shown are not even rendered anymore. The DOM is not even there. So that this is their default state. They are now not transformed. There is no transform right now on, on this component, neither on this one, neither on this one. Only during the animation itself, I transform them in CSS. Right? Um, never use position absolute and then move left, right. That's shitty, right? You want to do this in the compositor in the browser, and position absolute and the left top properties and so on are not done by the compositor, but by the renderer. It's way slower, or layouter, actually, which is way slower. So do this with CSS translates. Uh, makes it much faster. And don't use overflow hidden because you can break out and take over the full screen. So you don't need to travel with state all the way up to your application component and trigger a pop-up. Any component can do that. And you can do cool effects like, uh, oh, I'm not logged in. Let me just do that. Um. You can do a pretty cool effects like this as well. Because every component can just break out and take over the entire screen, meaning I can make every component kind of cover the screen, right? I can have a pop up or anything in any component. And so these kind of effects become suddenly really easy. And you don't need to bother about having traveling state. Um, yeah, so that's like one really, really good tip. Don't use overflow hidden, and don't do transforms that stick around after the animation is done. Our other tips. Uh, let's see. This is, since I spontaneously proposed this talk, I'll have to remind myself on the interesting things that we did. Add yeah, the image gallery again as a component. Um, like the interesting part, if you do these components um, kind of separately, like these model components, um, and you don't assemble them in the application, they're only, sorry, you don't assemble them in the application, uh, but you assemble them in something like Storybook, 
is that you can really focus on making that component great. Right? There's no distraction. There's no integration work or nothing. So in, in this case, like we could make sure that like you can navigate everything with, with the keyboard and everything has nice outlines so that people know where they are and you get the all the buttons obviously have their titles, right? Because they were required on the components, so they had to be filled in. Um, yeah, like it all comes together quite nicely. If you can just focus on making one thing great, it's essentially the, the old model of making big problems into small problems so you can really focus on solving them well and then you assemble them afterwards. So th this part really, really helps. I can show you how these components are being um, put together as well. It's really straightforward. Uh, this is the post component, has an ID, the URL, and all the parameters that the component would need. And then the actions. And then we passed in comment components and the comment box. And so this is a quite nice abstraction, we thought, because uh, this way, like even all of these kind of features to be able to, uh, with your keyboard, select names to tag them and all this kind of stuff. You can do all of this without the noise of the entire application around you. So it makes it way easier to design these things. Um, he has a drop-down component, and it's just reused in this composite component, right? And like escape works to escape out of things out. So it's a f it becomes fun. Like when you think you're done, and then, oh, we have forgotten keyboard controls. And then you add escape and all this kind of stuff to it, and, and enter and arrow keys and so on that should exist. And you give it the right ARIA labels so that like a pop-up really becomes a dialog box that like the browser understands as a dialog box and this kind of stuff. If you have never looked up ARIA, um, Google for MDN and ARIA, it's a whole new world of things. Um, very important topic. Uh, and you can even do like simple parallax effects in a few lines of code. Uh, like we coded this during another meetup. Um, like animating things on scroll is always the f best thing you can waste your time on, right? Um, but since this one is uh, just a background image that's uh, animated, the, the, the background position is changed with JavaScript. This is really just four lines of code to do this kind of parallax effect, which is becoming the norm these days, I think. Um, don't know if you're curious. Add scroll handlers. Remove scroll handlers. Never forget that. <laughs> and here, all you do is you position the background image by, let's say, half the top. That's, that's it. So, what do you think, um, with the amount of time that you spent uh, sort of making these components uh, generic uh, and um, reusable, uh, how, how much time, additional time do you think that you spent doing that versus you know, just putting the website together, kind of like hacking it together? Uh, good question. Like I. I don't know, like, luckily, the company I work in has a rather high standard in terms of to which degree these components should work. Um, so that, that question has not bothered me, meaning we can make them as well as we can, and then we ship them. And if we see something is wrong with them, we can fix them. Um, I think it has a certain advantage to do that. And you get rather quick over time, because if you start with some base components, uh, very, very simple ones, uh, and then you compose them into these model components that reflect some model object of your database. Like you, um, like you build yourself pieces that you can just puzzle together your website with. Everything else becomes so simple afterwards. Like the way I approach creating web applications these days is that I make them almost entirely work just in UI, meaning there's no backend connected to it. It's just the entire thing just works in, in UI as a fake, as a mock, right? So that I can nail down the user experience and how I want it to work. And sometimes I get lost in it too and like make it way too crazy. Um, and then eventually I plug in some, some back end. Uh, I don't know if you heard me rambling about this, but like I started a little project, a weekend project last year in April, exactly that way. 
it's a simple tool to order food at one of four restaurants that are currently supporting it. Um, but that whole thing just existed as a mock UI that you could just click through and it would do things in, in HTML. And um, if you want, later on, I put in MobX as a state manager and then I plugged in Firebase for persistence. And so it all just grew into the back end, if you will, from, from the front end. So did you build the, with, with those um, the smaller versions, I mean, there's obvious ones like buttons and stuff, but yeah. uh, when you're putting together the composite components, do you generally just start with the composite component and then start breaking stuff out, or do you sort of um, build the small pieces first, bottom up? Uh, uh, both ways. Like the obvious ones I start with. Like, so th there are a few, like the, the buttons is always a good thing to start with, right? And then you might have, um, like, sometimes you have certain input fields, although don't go too crazy on those, right? But like you, you, you start with the obvious uh, things, and wherever you see a sense for reuse very quickly, you, you go back and componentize something. For example, right now the, the avatar picture here is already. Uh, a component because it always has a link, it always has a certain thing over it, it comes in different sizes. Uh, oh, this is another good one. Always bind your components, you know, with 100% width or height as well. Um, and if you make inline block components, don't give them sizes like large or small or something like that. Ideally, make them respond to whatever the font size is at that time. You'll have a way easier time, like, because no developer knows what small is, right? You would need to look it up somewhere, but every developer knows which font size they're currently working with in this context, right? Only in a, like, at the same time, if you create a pop-up component like this, make sure you reset the font size to one REM inside of that component so that because it's now a new context that you're creating, right? But like for, for buttons, they should always listen to the font size that they're embedded in. Again, you're giving, because of the cascade in CSS, uh, like you're giving other developers that consume your components like a parameter that they can adjust the size of your component with that is in their control that you just inherit further down the tree, right? The DOM tree. So that's like another really good tip. Like never make a property with a certain size parameter, but just make it EMs. Like listen to the font size and and configure them accordingly because they typically co respond to the flow anyway, right? Um, so that's maybe another good good tip right there. Yeah. Anybody, specific questions to componentization and these, these things? I mean, these are just learnings from, from doing it and um, running into issues with other developers in collaboration because too much CSS was infiltrating other components and you changed something and it breaks millions of things and so on, right? And nobody wants that. I was curious about your action function. <coughs> just, I was curious about your code. The, the stories? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I mean, this is a storybook, so all the actions are just uh, so fake. What's inside the action function? Uh, it's a storybook function, meaning when I, when I click an action, let's say I want to post something, it just shows up in the action logger. It's just a logging event, right, so that I can see what objects I'm passing. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'll try to adopt a storybook on a number of teams now, and it generally starts out really good, but uh, people seem to fail to, it, it doesn't continue living. It sort of ends up in a state of disrepair pretty quickly. Yeah. Do you, how do you ensure that this stays up to date? Do you have like um, you know, visual regression tests or anything like that? Not yet. Or you just no, I, I mean, it happens in between, you know, like eventually you start implementing and like nothing uh, ever holds up to the, the real use case, you know, no matter how, how good you did it. And then you start fixing it for the real use case and then your story box is out of date. Yeah, that happened to me too, but like I essentially went back and fixed the storybook 
Because in the end, the storybook should become a documentation for other people. So these things will start becoming stickier the bigger your front end team is, because there are more people relying on these things. Uh, and you'll see that like, you know, the, the collaboration requires certain things to be up to date. And so, yeah, it's like just sitting down, going back and fixing them up uh, after some time because nobody hates broken documentation or outdated documentation, right? Like, it's like the worst. Um, so the more people you have on that team, obviously, the more feedback you get about these things and the more important they become. Yeah. So I'm, I'm maybe I'll even find in here a broken component somewhere, but um, yeah. The, the other cool thing, obviously, if components are done well, you can just do components inside components. Like, so we have a post inside a post. Like, if you share a post and stuff like that. So <laughs> I made it so that literally you pass a post tag into a post. I forgot where that was here. Um, yeah, here. You can do that too. <laughs> but. It's also, um, to come back to that issue, never write CSS that goes inside a child component. If you want to have a quick fix and you don't want to like, necessarily create a new parameter on that component and then implement it properly, at least write the CSS that you need inside of that child component. So if you, in this pop-up example, if you want this pop-up in a certain case to not have the header, then write that case into the CSS of that component. CSS is global, right? So you can say, if your CSS is inside of the uh, news feed page, then I don't want a header. But you don't write that CSS into the news feed page, but you write that CSS into the component. Because at least me, who then eventually goes and wants to update the component, sees it because it's there. I don't need to fish around for it. right? So you can make these things contextually aware. You know, There are these funny um, CSS selectors um, like the plus, right? If something follows another class, right? And the same way, maybe I did this here actually, um, somewhere. Maybe not in this one. But there are definitely components in here that say, like, if this component's outer class or ID is inside or follows a certain other component, then it should look slightly different, right? That's kind of OK. It's a bit hacky, but it's kind of OK if you do it inside of the component and everybody who works with that component can see it there. Right? It's better than having it somewhere else. Yeah. So that's maybe my, my quick summary on learnings on working with presentational components. And I hope you found something helpful in there. Um, and I want to end with uh, a little information. It's going to be a conference about um, not so much coding, but about working with developers and engaging with developers next week on Friday that I helped to organize. Um, it was kickstarted by Mozilla. Um, I think they want to get foothold in Southeast Asia a little bit and thought it would be a good idea to, to run a conference first. And so we helped them do that. Um, it's essential for everybody who works with or engages with developers to learn how to do that better and to understand issues and problems of developers and maybe also speak up as a developer during the event uh, to get your voice heard. There's still a few tickets available. So if you feel like this is an event for you, come on Friday. In any case, you should come to the Level Up Social, which is the night uh, the, af the evening afterwards, I think we have a sponsor for that too. Um, I think that's going to be in an arcade at Clark Key. Um, so some, some drinks and some hangout. It would be cool to see you there. That's it. Thank you.